Well, welcome everybody. Uh, today I'm joined by Brad Hazard, New South Wales Health Minister, Dr Kerry Chant, our Chief Health Officer here in New South Wales, uh, and Susan Pearce, the Deputy Secretary of New South Wales Health. Uh, can I begin by uh, extending our heartfelt condolences to uh, those families who have lost a loved one at this time. Uh, I want to continue to thank our frontline health service workers, our nurses, our doctors uh, on the front line day in, day out over the last two years, uh, who through this period of time, through this Omicron outbreak, continue to provide the care and support uh, for people right across our state um, who need it. Uh, it's been a difficult time for our state, but our health workers, our paramedics, our doctors, our nurses, our triple O call operators, our cleaners in our health system, uh, every single person is doing an inspirational and amazing job in keeping people safe during this pandemic. Uh, today, uh, we can announce uh, that in our, in our vaccination hubs, our 40 vaccination hubs across New South Wales, I uh, will be bringing forward the eligibility for a booster shot up from four months to three months. So that's in our 40 centres across New South Wales. We currently have capacity here for around two weeks uh, in our 40 hubs across New South Wales. Today's decision uh, will enable over three and a half million uh, more people from our state to be able to, uh, to be eligible for that booster shot. As we are clearly seeing, uh, boosters are key to keeping yourself, your friends and your family safe. Uh, due to the extra capacity uh, that we have in our centres, uh, we are able to make uh, this change today. I understand from uh, the federal government um, that the eligibility from four months to three months uh, in GPs and pharmacists will be, uh, will be available from the 31st of January. Uh, but if you, if you are eligible now at three months since your second dose vaccination, uh, you can make those appointments at our 40 centres right across New South Wales. Uh, we have the capacity available. Uh, we've seen very clearly uh, through the numbers in ICU that vaccination is key in terms of reducing symptoms and keeping people safe. So can I thank everybody uh, for the sustained efforts that they continue to make. We have today over 50% of those who are eligible for a booster shot have received one. For the 95% vaccination rate, that's incredibly pleasing. It's ensured compared to the rest of the world that New South Wales has been able to remain strong uh, during difficult times in this pandemic. The efforts that everyone has made across our state has ensured that we've been safe uh, during this difficult time. There'll be other challenges that come our way as we head through this pandemic, but the key strategy and the key thing that we can all do is continue that sustained effort to go and get vaccinated, uh, to get that booster shot. Today's announcement of moving that period from four months to three months will allow an additional three and a half million eligible people across our state to receive that booster shot. So can I encourage everybody over what's been a difficult period of time to continue to make that effort, uh, to make that booking. Um, they're available through our 40 centres across the state. Uh, we've seen extraordinary efforts from our nurses in, in those centres who have worked through the entire vaccination uh, program here in our state over many months. And now through this booster uh, campaign, continue to work tirelessly. Uh, we've seen those centres being incredible success uh, and today's announcement will ensure that more people are eligible to get that booster shot. We've seen very clearly in our health system that boosters have been key in keeping people safe. So can, can I encourage everybody across our state today uh, who's eligible now from three months since your second dose vaccination uh, to make that booking uh, at any one of our centres um, across the state. As I said, it's very key to ensuring you stay safe during this pandemic. And the Health Minister will make some further comments in relation to the clear evidence that we're seeing in our hospitals, in our ICUs, that vaccination and booster is crucial in reducing symptoms and having less severe cases of the disease. So once again, can I encourage everybody to keep that effort going as we move through this next phase of the pandemic. And we know that we'll move through this phase together uh, we, we can see the success here in our state. The numbers so far are incredibly pleasing. Uh, we're moving through, so can I thank uh, everybody across our state for the efforts, uh, the sacrifices that everyone has made, uh, not just over the last uh, couple of months, but more particularly um, over the last two years. So I appreciate uh, that there is fatigue with this pandemic. Uh, this global pandemic has 
has taken the world on, but New South Wales has continued to stand tall. And the reason we've standed, stood tall, the reason we've stood tall here in our state has been that high vaccination rate, the efforts, the sacrifices, following the rules that are in place. They're not there for the sake of it. They're there to keep you safe as we move through and make our way through uh, this uh, stage of the pandemic. We are making our way through it and we will make our way through it. And if we can continue to treat everybody with kindness and respect, particularly our health staff, our people right across our state, our friends and family, they are the great values of our state. But they are the values that will ensure that as we move through this transitional phase um, of the pandemic, that we will come out stronger the other side. I'm now gonna pass uh, to Dr. Kerry Chan, uh, who will give a public health update. And then Susan Pierce. Uh, will speak uh, to uh, the changes that we're making today in relation to the, that amendment and bringing forward that booster eligibility from four months to three months. Um, and then Minister Hazard uh, will provide some further health messages. So there are currently 2,863 COVID cases admitted to hospital, including 217 people in intensive care, 66 of whom require ventilation. There were 32,297 positive test results notified to 8 p.m. last night, including 12,450 positive rapid antigen tests and 19,847 positive PCR tests. Of the 12,450 positive rapid tests, 10,417 of these tests were from the previous 17 days. And in relation to the PCR tests, 19,000 847 PCR tests for results were returned from 84,976 PCR results. Sadly, we are announcing the deaths of 32 people with COVID-19, 12 women and 20 men. Um, can I pass my condolences to the loved ones for their loss? Three people were in their aged in their 40s, three people were aged in their 60s, eight people were in their 70s. 11 people were in their 80s, 7 people were in their 90s. Of the 32 people who died, 23 had received at least two doses of COVID vaccine, one person had received one dose and eight were not vaccinated. Um, five of that uh, 32 had received a booster dose. So I think, can I just echo um, what I know my colleague, Ms. Susan Pierce is gonna be saying is, it's, it's incredibly important that people come forward for their booster doses. Please get boosted now. I also urge people that have got children going back to schools to think about you and your extended family, ensuring that you're boosted ahead of the school year. And also that any elderly relatives are assisted in getting their booster. I can't stress enough the urgency. We know that booster will increase your level of protection um, and it is critical that we get that as soon as possible. In terms of the deaths, we have had some requests for more information around the deaths to better understand the underlying health conditions. And rather than reporting that every day, um, because of the issues of confidentiality, what we're going to be doing is regularly reporting the deaths and providing a little bit more information about the types of conditions that individuals have to better inform the community um, of the risks associated with those. But in, in short, we know clearly that over the age, pe people that are over the age of 65, people that have chronic conditions affecting their heart, lungs, kidneys, liver, and those with an immune um, suppressive condition. So, things that suppress your ability to fight infection. So that would be, for instance, if you had a transplant and were on drugs to suppress your immune system. We know those individuals are going to be at increased risk. And that's why for many of those individuals, particularly those with the suppressed immune system, we have recommendations for three doses as part of the primary course, and then subsequent um, boosting recommendations. So please recognize your risk get boosted as quickly as possible and get those children vaccinated but also it's an opportunity for the broader family and extended family to um, check that they're up to date with their vaccinations. Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, we're very pleased uh, once again across the New South Wales health vaccination clinics to be able to step up to the challenge uh, of increasing the number of boosters across our state. Uh, the three-month interval was due to commence on the 31st of January. Uh, we're very pleased to be able to bring that forward uh, to make automatically millions of people uh, now eligible to come and get that booster dose. Uh, so far across our clinics in, in New South Wales, we've given 400 and, around 450,000 boosters. Uh, as I said yesterday, we have the capacity to do a lot more. Uh, it's awful for us to see our bookings uh, in our clinics go begging. We'd really like to see all of those bookings absolutely full. Uh, there are bookings available today. There are book bookings available tomorrow in many of our clinics. Uh, we have plenty of supply of vaccine for the booster doses, so there are no issues for us with respect to supply, uh, and we're really very happy to be able to do this. Uh, as the Premier said, 50%, uh, over 50% now of the eligible people in New South Wales uh, have had their booster, which is a great uptake, uh, but we know that given the very high vaccination rates in this state, we can do a lot more than that. It's also really great to see uh, the 5 to 11 year olds coming out for their vaccines. Uh, yesterday was our biggest day of the 5 to 11 year olds. Uh, with around 4,700 kids in that age group vaccinated in the New South Wales Health Clinics. Uh, we, again, uh, will be making sure that those vaccine appointments are available for the kids. So the increase uh, in, in the uh, booster availability in our clinics will not uh, push out those appointments for the children, that the appointments are there specifically for kids across our clinics. Uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to those numbers going up. We watch them obviously very careful, carefully. Last year during the Delta outbreak, uh, we watched them like hawks every day and uh, we got used to seeing a very high number of vaccines being given in this state every day. I'd really love to see that happen again now as we work our way through this latest challenge. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd just like to also extend my condolences, sympathy um, to each of the families of those uh, 32 people who've passed away in the last 24 hours as a result of this pandemic. Um, and as the Premier has said on many occasions, let's never forget that each of these numbers are people with families, friends, um, and uh, to all of them, their families and friends, a deeper sympathy. It's certainly what motivates us every day to, as the health team to keep working to try and uh, uh, get through in a positive way this uh, pandemic that's challenging the whole of the world. But what we do know is that uh, um, wherever you are, you are vulnerable to this virus. And I want to emphasise that point that uh, you may think that because you're in a particular area, you're not. Uh, as vulnerable. Well, I just want to stress that uh, out of these 32 deaths today, these 32 people who passed away, 11, 11 of those people were from southwestern Sydney, nine were from Sydney's southeastern areas, four were from the northern parts of Sydney, two were from generally the western Sydney area, two were from the Illawarra Shoalhaven region, one was from the inner west, one was from the northern beaches. One was from the Central Coast and one was from the New England region. So no matter where you are in New South Wales, indeed Australia, you are vulnerable uh, to this Omicron vi virus as well as in a small, smaller number than now the Delta virus. So what is important then is no matter where you are, uh, to understand that you are not sheltered from this virus unless you have the shelter of both the social distancing issues that, 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 that uh, Kerry Chant, Dr Chant has, has uh, ensured that we're all very aware of, so wearing masks, so, um, being seated uh, um, in, uh, in hospitality areas uh, where possible, um, and also uh, this is advisory and we'll make sure of advisory and health orders, and of course uh, making sure that uh, um, you just keep your distance, that 1.5 metres still works very well, and of course at the moment, uh, still, while it's um, very prevalent, uh, working from home where possible and practicable. Um, 
At the moment we have 217 people in intensive care units across New South Wales um, and we have 92, 92 of that 217, so almost 50% are unvaccinated. That's the message. There is, in addition to those measures that, uh, that the government and Dr Chance and the entire health team have, uh, have either made into or given as health orders or as advisories, there's one simple, solitary, really important message. Get vaccinated. Um, if you think about it, about 95% of the community have had, uh, a, um, have had vaccinations. We're still working on the boosters. We want to see the boosters numbers increase uh, as dramatically and as quickly as possible. And hence the reason why we're moving uh, to a three months phase today, well, as of, as of uh, the 21st of January, but announcing it today. But if you have 95% of the population who are vaccinated and 5% who are not, and yet you've got almost half of the unvaccinated sitting in intensive care units, that's a very clear message, get vaccinated. If you get vaccinated, um, and preferably get the booster as soon as you are eligible, and there'll be many more people eligible as of today, you will be far safer. Um, you'll be amongst the safest people in the world. Uh, New South Wales has done all we can to strike that balance, giving us our, our lives back as we all want them to be. And looking around, many people are actually having more of their old lives back. And certainly, I think that's a positive. Um, but we also have to do it safely. So get vaccinated, get boosted. And as of uh, 21st of January, all those extra people will be eligible as a result of the decision of the New South Wales government to bring the booster program forward for three months. Thank you. Look, there's no doubt the health system here in New South Wales and around the world is under pressure. Uh, and our health teams, as I've said, are doing an amazing job, an inspirational job day in, day out. Uh, there is clearly many people uh, who are fatigued uh, over this pandemic, which is now stretched over two years. Uh, but day in, day out, they are on the front line providing the essential care and love to people who are unwell. Um, and whether that's in our hospitals and in our ICUs, I want to continue to thank them for the work that they do. Um, and they are doing an amazing job. Um, there's no doubt that in the pandemic, there'll be pressure on the health system. Uh, we continue to release um, that modelling every Friday and how we're tracking on that modelling. Um, as we saw last week, uh, there's no doubt that we are uh, tracking better than our best case scenario and that's reassuring and that's pleasing. Having said that on the other side, there are pressures on our health staff. Uh, with the furloughing of health workers uh, here in New South Wales, uh, that's put extra pressure on the system. Uh, extra challenges come with that. Uh, but there are also reassuring signs as we make our way through this pandemic, we will get through it. Uh, and the heroes on the front line are our health workers and they've, they've taken an ins they've been inspirational uh, during, during this pandemic, during the last uh, two years, during this recent outbreak. Uh, when I've visited many hospitals during this period of time and spoken to our health workers and listened to their concerns and thanked them for the continued work, uh, on behalf of the people of our state, can I just continue to say, uh, you are the heroes of this pandemic, day in, day out, working tirelessly to look after our loved ones across New South Wales. In relation to the specifics of, the, of their concerns, I might get them into the um, Look, obviously uh, our nurses and midwives, but particularly for me, the midwives are now doing nursing as well in a, in a broader sense for the patients and other parts of the hospital. And over uh, the period of the last two years, there's no question, um, all of the health staff, not just nurses, uh, the doctors, everybody, has been under enormous pressure and I want to thank them for that, um, for doing the work that they're doing. And our intensive care staff have been at the front line, uh, doing an incredible job. Um, and on behalf of the community, the broader community of New South Wales, I think we all owe them a massive thanks. As to the actual staffing numbers, um, since this government uh, came into government, we have employed another nearly 10,000 nurses. Um, and in the current four year period, um, we're employing another 5,000 nurses uh, to $2.8 million boost. Um, and uh, that certainly is aimed at trying to relieve the pressure on our frontline nursing staff. The government's actually put in 2.8 billion, so 
um, funding from taxpayers of nearly another $3 billion just in this current period to employ another 5,000 nurses over this current four-year period. So the government is doing everything it can. Having said that, um, I have been as health minister meeting with the Nurses and Midwives Association, the Union for Nurses and Midwives, um, and I have been listening to their concerns, um, and we are certainly considering some of the, the operational challenges they have inside um, intensive care units, and certainly they have been compounded um, by the, the pandemic. But uh, uh, all I can really say at this point is the government is doing everything it possibly can to address these concerns, and again, thank you. I'll add one fi final comment. Um, obviously, as, uh, as Deputy Secretary Pearce has said many times, um, our hospital systems operate as a network uh, so that we have, um, there might be, for example, an intensive care unit at uh, Westmead that's under massive pressure. And you heard the, the figures I announced a little earlier in regards to the number of, uh, of uh, cases and people who are passing away in various areas. That also reflects the number of cases in those areas. Um, and South Western and Western Sydney have been very challenged. And so you've got to expect that uh, uh, those, um, those intensive care units, those hospital beds, are under massive pressure. But, again, as, as uh, Deputy Secretary Pearce has made the point, we operate as a network. The entire health system is a network. That's the way it works right across Australia. Um, and uh, we move patients as is required. We've talked about that in many of these press conferences many times and patients do get moved. I think last week we were talking about patients being moved from Westmead to North Shore, to here actually, where we're doing this press conference today. So all in all, we're doing everything we can, working with the union, working with the nurses and midwives generally, uh, working within the network, putting a lot of uh, obviously money into additional nurses, and we'll continue to do that. And we're very much committed to employing those additional 5,000 nurses, many of them have already been employed, but more to go. Um, in this current four year period. Premier, what you just said there, is, uh, sorry, what the Minister just said, Premier, is there any consideration to looking at a surging plan where you call on the private health networks? And, and if so, is there any incentive payments that are being considered to people? We've had, look, um, you heard the Federal Minister yesterday talking about um, uh, agreements that have actually been in place since March uh, 2020. I remember, I think it was about March 29th, that we had the highest number at that period. And there was a lot of pressure going on. And in that month, um, all of the states agreed with the federal government that we would uh, um, negotiate with our private hospitals to have agreements in place. The federal government uh, um, helped each of the states and territories in regard to funding that uh, kept the private hospitals open. And as a result of that, we have uh, those arrangements still in place. And where necessary, we can actually move patients into the private sector. Um, what we are doing at the moment in New South Wales is essentially moving patients who are not COVID patients into the private sector. So we do get the benefit of the uh, incredible nurses and doctors who also work, quite often they work in both sectors. They work in the public hospital, they work in the private hospital as well. And so we do have that capacity to network and surge by using those staff. And just on is there any consideration of Look, the, the current arrangements for payment have been continual through the uh, through the pandemic, and it, it's essentially what we're all doing across Australia. So there's no um, particular um, call for that at the present time, and it seems to be working quite well at the present time. Sorry. Morning. Sorry. Sorry. Look, I think the QR codes have served an amazing purpose. As we've gone through this pandemic, there have been different pressures. I can't tell you every day uh, when I meet with our health team, we wonder what's going to be meeting us that day. The QR codes have worked really, really well at various stages of the pandemic, um, but they are still working to a degree in certain circumstances. I know I was at, I think, Woolworths on Sunday and I got a message saying I had to look out for symptoms. Um, because uh, of the fact that there's been someone positive in that environment. Um, it still helps us to individually to take personal responsibility for ourselves. So there are arguments, I think, that, uh, that go both ways at the moment, like everything else in health. Um, but 
constantly under discussion is what I would say. I'm, I'm not uh, rushing towards arguing to completely get rid of them, but I do think that they're, they perhaps have a higher priority in the areas that you're talking about. Uh, so the vulnerable facilities, aged care facilities, hospitals and so on. But they still serve, serve a purpose as long as we are actually looking at a history in our service New South Wales, which uh, because I've been well trained by Minister Dominello to do that, I was never really keen to do it, but I do now. And I do see that, okay, I have to be very careful because I happen to be there. So hopefully you're doing that too. Yeah, I mean, have you been, have you flagged that there's going to be a change? Or I'm sorry, sorry I just can't hear you with that. Sorry, Dr. Chance flagged that there's going to be a change to the way that guests are reported. Yeah. Um, does that mean that we won't be getting guests daily? Is it, is that no, no. No, what she was explaining, and uh, uh, this is, I emphasise this was a recommendation from Dr. Chant um, and the broader public health team. Um, the, the death, the very sad duty that we have each day is to tell the community how many people have passed away, amongst other things, that we do each day, and uh, uh, that will still continue. But what she was explaining to the Premier and I and to the rest of the, the relevant parts of the government is that to be able to give a really clear understanding of what is actually contributing to that death, um, they need to have some time, some considerable time, if somebody's passed away in a hospital, say in Western Sydney, that information has to be aggregated or collected by the doctors um, to work out was it actually caused by COVID, was it a contributing factor, what other factors were in play. Uh, and we've talked about that, I think yesterday and the day before, but health recommendation is to now move to that. If you like, I can get Dr. Chan to expand on that, or do you, I don't know. Okay, I'll ask Dr. Chan to expand on that. So I think that the key point is, is the thirst for information in some sections of the community. And to do that justice, because um, obviously in a 24-hour cycle where we, where we might be aware of a couple of patients that have underlying health conditions, that doesn't actually give people a sense of those conditions. But obviously we don't want to identify people, we don't want to disclose, disclose personally um, things that may allow, allow you know, worsen the, the impact on loved ones. So what we think is more useful, and, and as I've always said, look, a day in data doesn't mean much, but what's important is if we want to give the community um, the messages, they're clearly interested in knowing the vaccination status, and we, we will be able to do that, but also to explain what are some of the underlying conditions that um, are contributing to those um, poor outcomes and, and how that relates. So it's really about an effort to give better information to the community, but us we can't do that in a 24 hour cycle. So we will still report deaths, we'll still report vaccination status, but we will aggregate the, um, and give some more richer data um, in a, as timely a way as we can to just give a sense to the community. And that's really important because I think I've said in repeated press conferences this week, um, whilst I'm really keen that the kids get vaccinated, I really want a sense of urgency around the boosters, particularly those older, individuals and people with underlying health conditions, it is really critical that you ha act with such a sense of urgency. And so I would actually call on friends and loved ones, people with though in those situations, to really do everything you can to support them to get access. It's really pleasing to see our clinics opened up, but I really want a sense of urgency. We know that third dose takes seven to 14 days and so that is the best protection we can give, is having that third dose. So, so, so how, how, worried worried are you, though? how worried are you that when school goes back, you're going to have a whole lot of people exposed? Because obviously most children are going back, a lot of them aren't vaccinated. They're seeing their grandparents. We're, we're, we're due to be sort of, you know, kind of yeah. coming out of the peak at that point. Are you worried about another third reason you by school return? I think the numbers um, will go up and up and down and we know that when there's um, mixing and introductions of new social networks but we can also counter that through our own actions so we are currently working with government on the return to school plan yes when schools go back um, there are more connections of different social networks and an increase in cases would be expected but we as a community can take other actions to offset that but one of the keys is getting boosted we believe that by getting boosted, lifting that immunity, it will provide protection, but it will also reduce individuals' risk of, of catching the disease. So again, it will have some transmission protection, and so we would want to get as many people vaccinated next week and then week after, 
as quickly as possible and I'm really pleased that we've got that extra capacity and spare capacity that we can use and I just want to thank the community for coming forward and can I also just express my gratitude to the pharmacists and GPs. Um, they have been um, working really very hard as well in order to roll out and provide as many much access and I've also asked the community to be understanding if the GP is prioritising someone in a, in a higher risk group than someone else um, because we do need to get those most at risk people vaccinated and boosted uh, first. Is there, is, there, is there a directive at the moment on how long someone should wait after getting COVID before getting boosted? Okay, so ATAGI is, um, ATAGI which is the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation um, which reports and provides the advice. And they're, they're, they're basically the experts that give us the guidance and we link to that. They're currently working through these issues. But in essence, um, what we would generally say is if you recovered um, and generally in the four to six weeks after you've had COVID, then the proceed with your schedule. But ATAGI's currently got this under consideration. Um, having, a, having, a do having been exposed to um, COVID will actually boost your immune system. Um, but clearly we want to make sure that people are availing themselves of the additional protection from boosters. By having a lot of people um, being boosted now, do we risk finding ourselves in a similar situation to say December, as we go into winter with lots of people having waning immunity and potentially you know, a bad winter wave of Omicron or the next variant coming through? I think, um, we will, the future is difficult to predict, but I think those scenarios of an upswing in cases prior to winter um, is something that we have to plan and talk to the community about. We will then, ATAGI will consider its um, advice, and I sort of flag that obviously we're watching the experience in Israel closely, where they're actually doing their fourth booster for those that are immunocompromised. I've also said that um, we will need to um, be aware that we will see upswings in cases and, and you know, we are going to have to adjust our settings, adjust our behaviour. Um, but 2022 um, is going to be a time where we've got those fantastic tools of effective vaccines. We'll have some antiviral um, therapies um, additionally coming. We've got some therapies now. Um, but that but that will be, we will be able to use all of those tools as well as those individual behaviours. Um, and we will also have a very strong focus on the vulnerable who will continue um, to potentially need to take special action. So, you know, they will have to be more diligent about choosing outdoor environments. They'll have to be more diligent about um, wearing masks themselves um, and, and adapting as we go through 2022. Well, if you're COVID positive, you aren't made to isolate. That is, that is the rule. Now, obviously, <clears throat> for critical workers, um, to the national government process, we've made exemptions for close contacts, um, and they are in place. And we've seen, obviously, the challenges to the distribution networks, uh, health system, um, and obviously, we'll work through our education plan, which we'll announce later in the week. Uh, but the rules are clear in relation to if you have. Uh, or tested positive for COVID-19, and that is that you need to isolate uh, for seven days. Uh, we have made that in line with the National Government's response. That's important in reducing transmission. Um, and my clear message to employers is you should not be forcing people to come to work in circumstances where they are positive for COVID-19. Premier, pharmacists are overwhelmed. Uh, do you agree with the education standards authority threatening media outlets with uh, big fines to publish in HSC leave data? Well, my understanding from what I read this morning was that Nessa has said they have not been doing that. So I don't think there should be anyone threatening with fines. Obviously, I believe in greater transparency. I think the more transparency you have um, in a system like that, the more informed decisions people can make. I think it's always, it's always uh, useful. Um, for educators uh, and for members of the public, and mums and dads and teachers to understand um, educational outcomes. 
Having said that, there's a balance with that because I think sometimes information that can be provided does not actually lead to the analysis uh, that comes off the back of it. And I, I think you've got to be very careful when you are releasing information. There's a whole range of figures in relation to educational outcomes that need to be considered. It's not a black and white issue. Uh, so I can understand why in a number of cases certain information might not be provided because it may lead to uh, reducing confidence in a system when it doesn't need, uh, when, when there's no need for that confidence to be lost. Uh, but having said that, I will always, as Premier, I always believe that we should uh, we should err on the side of transparency. Transparency in providing information is crucial. And I think particularly, you know, as we're going through COVID, the decision we made in releasing the modelling for hospitalisations and where we're tracking is important because providing information to the public instills confidence in whatever area of public service. Just to bring you to staff meeting, so I understand the federal government today now to make a commitment to EP, private sector staff enter the public sector to help with hospitals. The state government, I think, announced similar measures in August. Yeah. Will that announcement by the federal government make any difference here? Well, the advice I've received is not really, um, because we've already obviously working with the private um, health system with, with the announcement that we made a couple of weeks ago, as, as you correctly asked. Um, so but we'll, we'll work through the details of that, but we're already operating as other states are and working very closely with the private health system in providing care for patients during COVID. So uh, look, I'll continue to take advice on that, but my understanding is not no. Premier, 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 Premier,
um, as a people, we're working through it and we will get through it. And our country is still tall during this pandemic um, and, and just like those around the world, but we're in a much better position today in Australia because of our high vaccination rates. And the change we've made to booster shots today, as Dr Chant has said, uh, should provide confidence uh, that with a highly vaccinated population, there will naturally be less pressure on our health system than other areas or other health systems around the world because people, our people, have made that enormous effort. And today's announcement is really a call to arms, literally, for people to go out and get that booster shot. It's been three months since your second dose vaccination, you can now get that booster shot at one of our centres. Um, so please make that appointment because the efforts that everyone has made today, has that's been the key factor in putting downward pressure on the hospital system. Well, Premier, 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 it's been a couple of months now since the Omicron wave first appeared. Are you satisfied with both the speed and the amount of support available for businesses? Is there anything the federal government could be doing to help out here? We'll always ask for support from the federal government when it comes to um, assistance. Uh, but look, as the former treasurer, I mean, I know going through the last two years, when you move through these different waves, there's always a call for assistance. And we have always, as a government, prioritised support for businesses and our workers uh, before the budget. Um, and we've been able to do that more than any other jurisdiction in the country because of the strong financial position New South Wales was in going into this pandemic. What's important though, when you're going through this phase, is that you consult widely, you work with business groups, you work with those organisations and make sure uh, as a government that that financial um, investment from the state makes a difference. Now one side's the financial investment, one side's the regu um, you know, re um, amending regulations and making it easier for businesses. That was a key factor last year. And I can tell you from the feedback as a former treasurer, that for a lot of businesses, the support in terms of Real, um, reducing regulations and red tape for businesses made a real difference. Now I noticed, I noted this morning that the Treasurer was out um, uh, speaking to this and some of the changes that he's looking at and the government will work through. But I can, I, can, I can assure businesses across the state, just like the last two years, we've got your back as we move through this transitional phase. Uh, there's no doubt, we're now seeing what learning to live alongside the virus is like. It's been a, it, we've been talking about it as a cliche, but as we move through with a highly vaccinated population, it's going to create challenges, which we're seeing, but our efforts in you know, getting through this period of time uh, will ensure that we do, just like we did for the, we did for the last two years. But I always, uh, I always think when it comes to providing that support, best to consult, target that support to where it's needed and where it will make a difference. That's what we did over the last two years, and I know as we move through that period, there's always the questions that come through, well, you know, Omicron started or Delta started, but best thing for governments to do is assess the situation, ensure that the investments are made are evidence-based. We've done that over the last two years, and my advice to the Treasurer has been work through that process first, understand where the need is, and then we make then we make the policies off the back of it, rather than jumping over and making decisions that then you get to the situation where the investment you make doesn't have the impact and ultimately as well these are taxpayer dollars that need to be spent wisely in areas that will make an impact and I think if you look at the last period of time every outbreak during this pandemic our economy has rebounded strongly and we've kept people in work and that's you know, our, what, what we're focused on as a government is keeping people safe getting people boosted uh, keeping society open uh, and keeping people in work so they can provide for their families. And that's the balance that we've had over the last two years. And that's what we'll continue to do as we move through this transitionary phase and into whatever next challenge this pandemic throws at us. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Will you push the PGA to approve more apps made by Australian companies to help guarantee supply? And on that note, do you have any comment on the 42,000 Japanese tests which were stolen from the warehouse and mascot over? Well, yeah, the police will catch you, and and the police will catch you, and at a time, at a time when everyone across our state has made incredible efforts in keeping people safe, in making sacrifices, what a disgraceful act, uh, and the police will catch you. What about the TGA? Sorry, so the TGA. Well, this has been one of the issues. I mean. 
there's obviously a shortage, as we know, of rapid antigen tests, but let's not forget, in two states around the country, up until the last couple of weeks, rapid antigen tests were illegal in those states. Um, now, uh, as soon as we were able, here in New South Wales, to procure substantial amounts of rapid antigen tests, we went out and made those purchase orders. And what you'll see in New South Wales is, uh, from a government's perspective, uh, outside our responsibilities, we have made the decision to go and procure uh, more than any other government across the country uh, because we think and we believe that those tests will be important to keep our frontline service going. But ultimately, you can't procure tests that are not approved. Um, so we, we obviously rely on the advice from uh, the TGA. That provides greater restrictions uh, for governments or for chemists and supermarkets to purchase tests. But ultimately as well, from the T I'm just, I'm just, you would assume from the TGA's perspective, there's no point procuring a rapid antigen test if it doesn't actually work. So we'll work through those issues with the TGA, but ultimately what we've done at the state government is gone ahead, purchase ones that are approved, and will make a difference and help people, keep people safe. Does that mean, Premier, that um, you believe that, um, that, that as a nation we've been slow to embrace this new technology? Is that Well, PCR testing has been incredibly successful um, here in our state. Incredibly successful. And the testing rates in Australia are world leading. And I think that has been crucial in terms of ensuring we've kept people safe. The efforts that people make, particularly over the summer break, where those queues were incredibly long, the patience of our people and the sustained effort on testing um, has ensured we've had downward pressure on our hospital system. And that's why if you look at the facts, and when we're through this pandemic and we all take a step back, and I know we can be critical and disappointed and anxious during a pandemic, that we step back and look at the success in Australia compared to anywhere in the world. I think we've been truly blessed, and that's been on the back of the efforts that people have made. And when it comes to rapid antigen tests, um, the, the TGA approved in sometime in November those tests as we, um, as we, as we move through. Um, and I know even post that point in time that they were illegal in a number of states. So there has been a transition from PCRs to rats. I think that's going to be a natural aspect of living alongside the virus as we move through. As I, as I said, I believe that 2022 looks like families across the state having rapid antigen tests in their medicine cupboard. I think that's part of, that's going to be part of life um, as we move through. But from our state's perspective, what we want to do is make sure those people who are vulnerable get access to those tests. Um, and uh, we will use those tests that we have purchased to keep uh, those government services as we move through 2022 functioning as seamlessly as possible. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thank you.